you know, are white, but you have those people that you can be just open and honest with. And you can tell them anything and everything and you know that they still love you and that they're not going to leave you and they're not going to expose you. But Jesus says, no, I have a different way. And Jesus says, do what I say and watch what I'll do. So for us, we didn't wake up one day and feel forgiven. You do it. You do it. Spend time journaling and, and thinking deep. Scripture will transform our minds. Scripture will transform us. Scripture will transform the way you look at leadership. We cannot separate, as believers, we cannot separate leadership and Scripture. That, that respect and that respect. So I'll do my best to play in that. Uh, the... Too often, Christians feel the pressure to pretend the gospel diminishes pain. That foundational piece is acceptance. Nothing happens in relationships without acceptance. And this is where we connect without judgment. It's grace, it's saying, I'm here for you. Good. Hey. Well, look who it is. <laughs> Dr. B, Dr. Becky. The, dyni the dynamic oh, doctor duos here, and, the Thompson. The, the elder Thompson. Yeah, the very elder. <laughs> oh, no, man, you're looking good. You really are. You All you needed to do is get out of that stress box, you know. Yeah, I do know. <laughs> we Don't all. We know. all. <clears throat> it's good to see you. Randy, good to see you. You bet. Judith, are you speaking today? My dad and I are. Well, I was I was checking to see if she knew she was muted. Oh. Uh, yeah. She she's driving the babies back home, so she will not be speaking until ah. when she sits down. I got you. Yes. Well, well, I see how uh, I see how this is going to work today. And uh, Timothy, you have you got any assignments from uh, from our our fearless leader Judith? Yes, I did. It's a one page picture. One page picture. All right. Would you, you, like got that, you got that yes. down? Yes, I do. All right. We've we've got uh we've got our technical we've got our technical down here. And uh but before we get too carried away with that, I was gonna see. Let's see who's out there as we we get this built up here we're still having people coming in randy yeah the uh, it as you becky may have told you um we were dr thompson excuse me becky dr thompson probably told you that uh, we're we're a little slow getting on sometimes so we'll get there Are you are you doing anything fun with your uh, with your extra time? That's for you. For me? Yeah. Oh well, I, I still garden. I'm still uh, serving at the church, and I I I just finished one semester of full time work at Oakwood, which I was uh, was in many respects very good, but totally exhausted me so <laughs> I, I in answer to to that i've been sitting a lot the last two weeks 
contemplate <laughs> life. <laughs> Good for you. That's I I have uh, what what were you doing back? Were you were you doing well at the same time at the same time that the university was downsizing? Uh, the music professor took a leave of absence the day before classes were supposed to start. And I had been um, accompanying the musical groups for the last two years. So I, I became the natural person to take over because I knew the students. So the day before classes, they asked me if I would do it. And I said, yes, I didn't realize I had signed up for five classes. <laughs> five? Five. <laughs> two, two classroom subjects and three performing groups. So, oh. Yeah. yeah, I did it. Well, you know, just the fact that you're uh, you're just having to sit down for two weeks. Uh, I, I I don't know if I could have done five classes in one semester. That, that would have been, that would you been know, fun. you just have to you just do what you have to do. You do what and you have to do when there are students, right. there are students involved and they're forming their lives. It becomes a pretty good driver. Indeed, indeed, but it yeah, that's that's taxing. Are they doing how, how's how what's new with Oakwood there? Well, there's a new president, you know, Jim Don, yeah. who worked with the with the uh, foundation board, I think, or those uh, one one of the big boards of the Wesleyan Church nationally, yeah. and um, so he's been trying to correct some financial errors that were left or that he inherited and it's been a long long process and uh, nice. so i stuck with him i was on the advisory board i'm still on the foundation board and that's because i, I started that foundation board i'm not ready to give it up yet <laughs> yeah. Good. it's it's needed it's a special place yeah well, let's. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to do. Unfortunately, um, doctors, I, I've got um, I've got duties in being in charge today, and so as we fumble and uh, make mistakes, uh, I ask for your forgiveness in advance, and uh, we'll we'll try to get this this done right. I, I don't do it as well as Judith. And so I'm going to I'm going to ask uh, Timothy. Let's see if we can get Timothy. Timothy, would you open us up in prayer today? Here you go. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for such a wonderful day. We thank you for the doctors, the your doctors that you've given us. We thank you for everyone that is joining us today and all those that are going to catch up later online and those ones who are joining us right now. May you bless them. And Father, as we are talking about burnout and self-care, may you show us the importance and the priority we should take in taking care of ourselves and how we can heal from any kind of trauma that any of us would be going through. Father, we pray that you may continue to guide our teachers as we go through this session to the end. And we shall live here refreshed and healed in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Dr. Becky, can I say one thing before we, we hand you the baton? Sure. For, for those of, of you all that have, have not studied trauma and, and, and the impact of, of trauma on people, it, it, is, it is something profound. And it's, it's a thing in an area that, that we don't give its due. We, we don't we don't appreciate the impact that it has on people and and we ignore it at, at our own sometimes our own demise and so this is an increasingly important topic because again as a reminder Jesus has come to do what for for all of us to restore us and what's he restoring us from it's from the effect of the world on us and in our own sin nature and so I'm really excited about today. Um, I'm excited for you guys to uh, to, to learn uh, from people who've uh, not only taught this, but have lived it. And that speaks at least to me. So Thompson's. 
<laughs> I'm handing the baton off to you in hopes that I don't say anything stupid from here on out. <laughs> well, thank you. Can you can everyone hear me okay? I'm on a different computer, but and I'm muted, but you can hear me through my dad's iPad. Uh, okay, so that's good. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming back this week. It was a pleasure to get to speak with you last week. And it looks like everyone, just almost everyone took the, the trauma tool that I had sent in the link and we got your results back. And based on what Judith is saying, uh, we're all in burnout and uh, really struggling with coping um, in the helping profession and in the ministry. And I'm so glad that you took the tool and um, have just become, that's the first step in really becoming self-aware and recognizing, you know, uh, the, what's going on in your own personal, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And so the next phase is really, okay, so now that we know we're all struggling with this burnout and, you know, experiencing other people's trauma, uh, vicariously, then what do we do about it? And as I was kind of reflecting, um, once I got the results back from Judith about what we should do next, I was really brainstorming on who do I know <laughs> that could help us with the next step? Because I am, I'm a nurse and um, I've experienced, you know, what you're experiencing and you've heard a little bit about that last week and when I shared some of the stories of the things that I've seen and heard. And then I kind of shared too what I do personally from a self-care perspective, which I hope was helpful to you and uh, just some things that you can do for yourself. But I think that there's so much more that we can do and learn from each other. My dad, Dr. Randy Thompson is with me here today and he is actually a group leader for survivors of uh, trauma and grief. So what a better person than um, an experience in his own life dealing with tragedy of uh, the loss of his wife and uh, the uh, a cancer diagnosis, overcoming cancer, um, the loss of a child. Um, he's, he's personally been through it all, but more than that, he's overcome it. And everything that I know, I give credit to my dad. He's been my role model in my life. He um, ha obviously has the heart of an amazing father, but he also has a heart after God. So I think today he's going to bring us a really good word that can help us to maybe take the next step in really figuring out what we can do together as a group to move forward past the trauma and to be healthy together. So this is my dad. My dad's going to start um, by sh kind of sharing what he's been through. And then he's got some tools and tips for us to help us through uh, surviving vicarious trauma. Thank you for being here, dad. Thank you, Becky. <laughs> Um, I think uh, we're all at different stages in our lives uh, as I look at the screen. And uh, in my case, there's kind of a summation of experiences that I carry with me. In many of your cases, it may be a first event, it may be a second event, or it may be uh, mildly cumulative as well. In my case, um, I, I grew up, I, I would say that I consider my life when I was a young boy really like a fairy tale. It was uh, uh, a very peaceful, safe period in my life. And uh, I didn't experience any losses at all uh, until an elder, elderly member of our family died. And that was when I was in my, my 20s. And so it seemed normal to me. And though I grieved, I was able to move on. When I was married, um, when I was a senior in college, the, fresh, or the first semester of my senior year, I married Judy Davis on December the 17th. And uh, we both graduated that year. And I went on to graduate school and Judy went on teaching. 
And uh, in uh, 1968, she became pregnant with our first child. And uh, our, our first daughter, Debbie, was born on the January 25th, 1969. Six months after that, she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And uh, she survived about two and a half years and ended up at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, taking what, what uh, was at that time the very first trials of chemotherapy. And uh, when she died, I was in a, just a state of disbelief. I didn't understand what had happened. I couldn't express myself. And frankly, I didn't feel anything. And I was very worried about that response because I felt like I should have been able to express myself fully in an emotional way, but I wasn't able to do that. And uh, at that point in my life, 1969, there were no, no resources to help me with what a normal recovery might be like, or even that what I was feeling was uh, normal or felt by other people. And uh, then 20 years to the month of Judy's death, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I always thought there might have been a connection between her death and my physical expression of that death in terms of cancer, but it was never nothing published about it until really just recently, but there is a connection between trauma and a person's physical health. The, uh, the word that we use for trauma can be a wide ranging group of experiences or it can be a cumulative thing. It can be something as simple as losing your job. It can be something as tragic as suicide or other kinds of losses. It's all uh, about context and not, uh, not knowing what your context is in Africa. I can only imagine what circumstances that, that you run into day in and day out. But I found here in the last five years, uh, excellent resources on that process that I went through as a young man, really without uh, too much success. It was my second wife, Sherry, who suggested that maybe I hadn't grieved properly. And she was so right. And we've been married now for 50 years. And Becky is our first daughter together. And we have two other daughters together for a total of four daughters. I have come to find out that shock is a very common thing and the feeling of numbness as a result of shock is a very, very common way of feeling. And uh, I'd be interested to know uh, whether any of you have experienced shock uh, with uh, either a, a lot of emotion or with the feeling of numbness. Would, would any of you care to share your experience with trauma in terms of your, your uh, reaction to it? And we'll move on from there. But if someone would like to share as well, that'd be great. Anybody? I think she, uh, that Becky has put a slide up in front of you that gives uh, the current thinking about grief, which is expressed in 10 stages. The thing to understand about these stages is they do not come in this order or this particular order to any two individuals. They can start somewhere else and progress in a different order. And you can also repeat stages in the process. This particular list of 10 uh, stages comes from the book called Good Grief, written by uh, Granger Westberg. Granger Westberg is a medical doctor 
and a doctor of theology. So he expresses in his book a correlation between our emotions and our physical health. And that is, has been a very profound uh, revelation for me. Uh, the last session that I had of uh, grief support group uh, ended up being a, a very unusual one. I had uh, publicized that I would be starting a grief group. And when the time finally came, one young woman showed up. And I was a little surprised, but I also feel like God's in charge. So if, uh, if that was who was supposed to be there, then she was it. So instead of uh, telling her that it was too small to have a group, I decided simply to have her share what her experience was with me. And as she began to share, it became very shocking to me, but her husband had committed suicide. And it was, uh, she was a young woman too, 25 years old, the same age I was when I lost my first wife. So at that moment, we had a connection because she could see that I had survived for 50 years after a shock like that. She also understood that she had a long life to live and needed to live it to the best of her ability. So on that night, I decided that I would commit to her being the group and that we would seek to get the rest of her family involved in the grief group um, because all of them were undoubtedly in the same shape. So for the first couple of weeks, I met just with her and we talked about what other people were involved in hurting. By the end of the first month, we had every member of her family and her husband's family in the grief group. And at that first meeting, they all realized that they were in shock and they couldn't even come up with a timeline of what had happened. But as we visited, they all agreed on a timeline. It was, it was really the moment in which they started a healing process. And I say that only to say that many times the best way to approach healing from trauma is in a group. It's like we're having today because it's in a group that you recognize that you're not alone. And it's in a group that sometimes things get said that really move your spirit and help your brain to unravel all of the trauma and the shock. Shock is interesting because it, 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 the minute you go into shock, your brain is almost unable to think. It's as though the world comes to a halt for a moment. And it takes time then to unravel what's happened. And many of you may have experienced that. It takes time and uh, to try to do that alone becomes very difficult because you don't know what questions to ask. You can't even think of what the most important concept might be. But when you get in a group, this happens kind of organically and it just moves along very well. Now, in terms of the other uh, points that are listed on the 10 stages, they're all, I think, pretty self-explanatory except that they come in a different order for everybody. Not everybody will feel all 10. You may pass through something, but everyone is bound at some point to have a moment of emotion and long periods of depression, even to feel physical distress, at times panic, because you really get surprised suddenly a set of circumstances that puts you back into the shock. Then you might feel guilt because you survived and the other person didn't. It's quite common for people to be angry with other family members and particularly at God. And there is normally a resistance 
to returning to normal living or returning to the, the vocation that you might have. It doesn't come till the later ages where you begin to build up some hope for the future. And I finally came about 15 or 20 years ago to the point where I can carry Judy's death next to me every day with a sense of joy in remembering her with no distress, shock, or emotion. And I understand that the way that I'm carrying her with me at this point doesn't take away from my marriage to Sherry. It simply honors Judy as a person who shared my life with me. And it gives her memory some significance, I think, for her daughter, Debbie, and for our, our other three daughters. So I think that the goal of coming through a traumatic experience is the concept of carrying that event with you because it, you can never leave you, it will always be with you, but carrying it with you with a sense of triumph and a sense of joyous remembrance about what you have learned. Um, and with that, Becky, I'll turn it back to you and maybe you can direct us somehow from here on. Sure. I, you know, it's interesting that you use the word triumph because that was the title of my presentation last week. Really? The title of my presentation last week was Triumph in Tragedy. And, um, you know, I truly believe that even though we have all experienced this trauma through other people's traumatic experiences or through our own, that there is a way that we can move into triumph, um, particularly because we know that this, these stages of grief actually is God's way of helping us heal. So I think it's important that we understand the stages of grief, um, this is definitely new information and not anything that we have talked about before, as far as I know, um, recognizing that these stages, these 10 stages of grief um, are, like you said, it's very common, it's normal, it's to be expected, it doesn't come in one way, shape, or form, that um, everyone experiences this in a different way, but um, if we can work through the stages, then we can reach the hope and accept acceptance, which is really easier said than done. Um, one thing that I really appreciate that my dad brought up today is the importance of group um, therapies and getting together and talking about it together as a group. Um, Dr. Brian and Pastor Risa, I know that what you, what our friends and family in um, Africa experience is, is a lot, probably even more than what my dad and I, you know, have experienced in our own trauma. And so I wonder if there's a way that, you know, a separate group could be set up for them to talk through the stages. Um, I also know that it's hard to talk about, you know, it's, Sometimes and I noticed that when my dad asked if anyone wanted to share, nobody said anything. And, I, you know, I know that it's hard to talk about and it's not easy. And especially um, I know that it, in my in my friends um, case that a lot of people just kind of keep together and don't say anything. And I think that honestly, I think that that could contribute to a worsening case of burnout. Um, if we if we don't talk about it and we don't reach out to each other and open our hearts and open our minds and trust each other with our deepest feelings, then we can't get to that hope and acceptance. Um, it's just a reality of the situation. So I don't know if my question would go back to Brian and Dr. Brian and Dr. Risa. What are the possibilities or chances of being able to set up um, some kind of a grief group? Um, and or would everyone in the group even be willing to share? So my question is, you know, we've got all of the information, we've cut, we've talked through, we know we're all in burnout, we know we are all experiencing vicarious trauma, we know what the stages of grief are, 
Um, we're, we are together in this group right now talking about it. And we're opening up the conversation and creating a platform of safety and a, a platform, um, you know, where we can heal with each other. So what are the possibilities of creating a Zoom for anyone that just wants to talk about what they're going through on, at a separate time? Is that even a, a possibility? Becky, I, I would I would put a re resounding vote of yes on that, and I'd love to be involved in that. I I, I came to grief, I, I came to understand grief in a way that that I did not know existed, did not appreciate it, didn't understand it, um, and then on top of that, the male dynamic. Mm -hmm. We don't do male and grief sometimes very well because it almost feels counter to what we're supposed to be and i'm in my my vote becky judith what what do you think of that did you hear that yeah i'm sorry i'm driving so i hope you can hear me we can. Sounds good. Okay, good. Uh, I think I, I want people to put in the chat what they think. Uh, and it is true that we don't know how to talk about how, what we feel or how we feel and the pain and the effects of what we've gone through. Mm -hmm. Myself, I keep telling people I don't know how to tell my own story because it feels like it's mine the worst story so that has to be told. I'm always comparing it with there are people I've seen worse days and that makes me keep quiet. So we need to learn how to, to share some of these things, but also to make sure that we are safe. Of course, I don't want to share my grief and everything and then hear it on Facebook the next day. Right, so, we have to maintain yeah. privacy. There, there are also those, parts that need to be considered, but it is true again that, I mean, if we keep quiet, that's how we end up where we are in burnout and in trauma. So I'm going to follow up and see who is willing and how, how we can make it a safe place for people to actually come and find healing within the group dynamics. But, but that is true, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. I might add one more thing uh, is that they have they have found clinically that even seeing one on one a counselor is not as effective as a group with simply yeah. a leader, not a counselor, but someone who can can give leading questions can just lead. And because what happens is your family and friends get tired of giving you encouragement after a certain amount of weeks or days even in some cases. And then you have no one to go to except God and God is always there with you, but he expects other human beings uh, to be there for you too. And a, a group really provides that positive avenue. So dad, on that note, if you were leading the group today, because we do have a couple of people who already said they would be for it, mm -hmm. how would you start a group, a grief group for pastors uh, living in Africa that are all in burnout? That's a great question. Well, I, I think that that is probably something that would need to be arrived at in, a, in the first meeting uh, with the group. Uh, basically, a group uh, it's one of those, those things that as you get to know each other, you come up with a group will, so to speak, very, very readily. And because one person makes a comment that leads to another and you, and then you all have an awakening of sorts. And so I would suggest that you, that, uh, that you do that at the first meeting and uh, kind of get a consensus of, uh, going through a list like this, for instance, and just identifying which of these feelings 
have you had or are you currently having? Or which ones do you think you've moved through? And where do you think you're at on the list? Mm. And it might give you some idea, um, even uh, be, particularly because everybody's time frame is going to be a little bit different in terms of when they experience their trauma as opposed to today. Uh, so they're all going to be on a different track. But regardless of what track you're on, um, you can talk a while about a stage that you've been through while someone else is still going through it. And it's still helpful. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Would anyone be willing to share where, which emotion you are experiencing right now um, as far as your grief, trauma, and burnout? And Dr. Brian, if there's no answer, will you share? <laughs> That's unfair. I have to be vulnerable? Yes. <laughs> I don't want to be vulnerable. My dad and I have already shared our hearts. And I was really vulnerable last week when I told you how burned out I was to the point that I, I basically walked away from the ministry for, you know, nine months when Roe versus Wade was 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 turned, I bolted, which is also a common, you know, symptom of shock. I, I bolted and I didn't look back. I didn't feel There's bad. One. I didn't um, have any regrets. I mean, of course, now I regret it because I realized that wasn't healthy for me to just leave like that. How could I do that? I, I you know, I abandoned my team. I abandoned my, my, um, clients I abandoned their children you know um I, I'm I've already been vulnerable <laughs> so you know um, I know that that everyone's ha having a hard time opening up is kind of you know the first step so yes I'm putting you on the spot but let's give let's give everyone just a minute <laughs> to see if there would be anyone willing to share you know if we uh, we've got several comments at this point that people are are considering it and you know that it is hard to be vulnerable but that you know they're already experiencing anger um part of that first step is not just typing it in the chat but sharing with the group um, and we promised, I think I can say for Dr. Brian and Dr. Risa to maintain privacy uh, you know, not to post anything on Facebook or to share anyone's feelings. And I think we should make that commitment to each other as well. Yeah, I, oh, we have, we have, uh, we have someone, it sounds like they were going to say something. I wanted to say something. Perfect. I'm called Kato Thomas. And um, I'm a pastor. I don't want to share a personal experience right now, but um, something I saw in the recent time of um, one of a, um, a young parent that lost her baby. I visited um, the hospital and prayed over the baby, but you know, the baby didn't get healed and the baby passed on. Um, I think in the latest time, this has been one of my hardest um, situations to handle because it seemed like the, the, the young mother was grieving and she was, um, I don't know how to say it. She was grieving. I don't know whether it's like that in the West, but she was, if I can use the word over grieving, like, you know, she's crying and she's um, everywhere and she's refusing to be comforted and people are coming around. And myself as a pastor, I come in and uh, try to get her attention and she couldn't, um, she just couldn't stop grieving. And um, I didn't know what to do. Well, God helped us through the situation and through the whole process, but 
Um, I just want to ask, uh, before we get to the personal uh, situations that come in our lives, um, for the pastors, I don't know how they go about such situations where you, of course, you have to allow the person to grieve, but it's like it's if somebody is crying for six hours and there is nothing that you you can you can do to to have a, a constructive conversation or to to understand the pain that she's going through. Thomas, I think that uh, you've stated something very profound and very common. Thank you. Thank um, you for that. You bet. And this is um, one of the hardest things to watch a person grieve and be able to do nothing about it. And uh, my, my word of experience would be that it's okay to simply let a person grieve without feeling any responsibility uh, for them to stop grieving because they're, they cannot, you, you can't come out of shock that easily. It's just one of those things. And so it's important uh, to let a person even encourage them, even if they're over emotional at times, to encourage them to express whatever they need to express. And that's the whole point of uh, having a group and talking beyond friendships and the period of time that family and friends are involved because people cannot say everything that needs to be said while they're in shock or even during the first uh, period of, of grieving. So it's important for them to just do whatever they need to do. And it, it, it's a completely unique experience for each individual. Um, uh, study has shown us that a person doesn't really begin to let go of anything or even be ready to talk about um, completing or a desire to complete the grieving process until about three months after a traumatic event. And that's uh, a very hard thing for a pastor to take. Uh, so about the, the best thing you can do is to pray for that person, uh, to spend uh, even time in silence with them if that's necessary, and to do all the listening that you can do. I know that when I was pastoring, I, I felt like I had to be the person with solutions. And uh, I felt a lot of uh, anxiety about not being able to find just the right thing to solve problems. And uh, I discovered later in life, and by the way, I never did tell you, but I, I turned 78 uh, last Friday. So I'm in <laughs> what they call the elderly <laughs> category officially. But I, I discovered that um, listening, allowing a person to say everything that needs to be said, or to cry as many tears that need to be shed and just listening with a holding hand and a listening ear is the most effective grief support until a person is ready to move to the next stage. And you'll notice in the steps that shock and emotion are right there at the top because they generally happen right together. Either, either strong emotion or total silence. Hmm. Becky, I um, to to and take your challenge. I I'm gonna I I want to tell a story that I, you know what what do you do, what do you do when you encounter it? And, uh, and I I had something burnt into my memory my probably my best friend in the world's a pastor down uh, down in texas and 
he lost his daughter. Um, and she was two, three, um, cancer. Mm -hmm. And I, I was the guy on the other end of the line with him as he was going through these, these processes, right. And is why did you let me down? God, why didn't you come through? Um, not understanding why God didn't heal when he could. And I, I remember just having no idea what to say. And so I just, I, I sat there and listened and, and ended up at the funeral. I'll tell you, tell you this story. And so we're, we're sitting in this gigantic church uh, down in Texas and and I, I look down and my buddy's doing the funeral of his own daughter. And he he gets up and the first words that he said were, thank you. And he said, it's all about Jesus. And he said, what I need to do is I need to worship. Mm -hmm. And it was such a profound juxtaposition for me to see a guy and, and hear all the ugly and the panic and the anger and the, the shock of it all. And him knowing if there was any hope for him, it's Jesus. And if, if that doesn't do it, it it's not going to happen. And I remember watching him give honor and glory to Jesus. And I watched worship happen in a way that I had not seen, and it was profound. And, and I, I, I think so often God uses community. God uses his people to touch us, right? But, but also at the same time, the God of the universe lives within you. He is the mighty counselor, right? He longs to restore us. And, and I, when we turn to the most powerful solution, um, it's a testimony. And so, Becky, that's immediately what came to mind. If I need to be vulnerable, I'll, I'll, I'll tell more on the group so I can pass the test today. But... <laughs> you know, I love that you brought in um, your faith and the pastor's faith. In that because, you know, we've we've kind of mentioned already that God gave us these stages of grief to help us through. Um, but we also know that he works all things for good and that even in our deepest, yes. darkest tragedies, something good and beautiful can come from it. And I think that that's, you know, what I hold on to in my own personal life is, uh, you know, the ending of my 22 year marriage is now an opportunity, you know, for me to find uh, a, the true love of my life. And yes, I, you know, it was the most painful thing I've ever been through in my entire, you know, life um, and to find out what was going on. But during that time, I, you know, I never was angry at God. I just saw it as, as uh, an opportunity to be hopeful, you know, for my future and to have a better life in, mar in future marriage for my children. And I think that's something that we can hold on to in as Christians, knowing that um, there is hope and there is, you know, acceptance of the pain um, for those of us that truly believe and have a relationship with the Lord and that we can worship him in those deepest, darkest moments. That's so powerful. You know, Becky, I was I was thinking in, in Randy or Dr. Thompson's. I, I'm getting my names all all messed <laughs> up. I'm, I'm from Oklahoma, so uh, we we we've got it pretty rusticated down there. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I one of the things I learned, um, two things, and and I'm curious what you, Randy, what you think about this. Um, scripture seems to indicate, at least to me, that, that God is drawn close in a couple instances. One is to humility. Humility, he, he 
he rushes to that, it seems. Um, and he's also near to the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted almost seems to, in Scripture, indicate that, that God moves near or moves closer or runs to that. I'm curious what you think, Randy. Well, I think that, that God didn't promise to save us from our problems. He, he promised to be there with us. Yeah. And uh, we, aren't, uh, we aren't aware of his presence, but he is there. And he's a God who has suffered himself. He lost his son. His son suffered. He knows what it's like. And um, I might, uh, Dora, I'm, I'm speaking, answering your, your point here, if you're listening. How, how do you deal with the most common question in such times is why? Most people ask, why God? Why God? And my question at the right time back to them is, why not? Hmm. You see, we're all susceptible to the powers of this natural world. There is no one excluded, no matter how wonderful your faith is. So whether the question is why or why not is almost, um, it's not irrelevant, but you've got to answer one and the other as well in order to have a real answer. Because uh, in my case, if I, had, if I had stuck with that answer, why, oh God, losing my first wife, how could I ever have had a successful second marriage? If I didn't ask, well, why not? Of course, I'm human like everybody else. It's gonna happen to even good people. And it does. So uh, that's a question that gets people thinking. And uh, of course, the answer is that, that God is there. He doesn't drive these events, but the, he's there when they, when they occur. And when you're ready, you'll know he's there and all will be well. Amen. That's beautiful. Yeah. And maybe to add on, uh, personally, I, I have I have um, I have faced some challenges in my past, uh, where most of them was very responsible and uh, they really hurt me. So I had a friend that I met in about the year two eighteen, and we used to talk about it, and she's always like, "Ah, uh -uh, don't worry, it's gonna be better." And I couldn't see any way it gets better. Now we met after about I think four years. And I'm telling her about the good things God is doing in my life and the blessings. And she asked me, now, what do you think when you see all these good things happening to you? And my response was like, uh, I feel like God is using every bit, whether I was responsible, whether it just happened, that everything, every series of everything that has happened to me, God is using it and turning it for the good. So I really believe that uh, it happens. And at the right time, we really... Uh, can ask the question and say, why not? Because it really turns out good. Amen. That's right. And you don't get there right away, but you'll get there. Yes. What? Randy or Becky, what, what did you experience or learn about Jesus? during your grieving through that process? What did you see about him that you had not seen before? Or maybe understood prior? I, I think the, um, the thing that I, maybe two things in there embedded together. One is that he's there even when you don't feel him. And um, if you don't hear him speaking, he's listening. Hmm. 
You know, um, I'm so glad you asked that question because I remember when I was a little girl, my dad shared with me a dream that he had about Jesus uh, dirt when he had cancer. Dad, do you remember the dream you had about I, Jesus? I had two dreams and they were, they were, uh, well, I, uh, let me, let me backstep a little bit. Uh, they had diagnosed me with um, terminal prostate cancer in 1992 and they weren't going to do any treatment. It was uh, not, if this was not uh, a case in which any treatment was doable. And uh, the, after the doctor told me that, I thought about it for, for a few days and I had been praying. And uh, I had this dream and it was such a powerful dream that I, I woke up my wife in the middle of the night and I told her about it and I said, I think I'm gonna be okay. And the dream was very simply this, that um, I was in a horse and, horse and a buggy, something like a horse and a buggy and we were traveling and I realized there was someone sitting in the seat behind me. And when I looked, it was Jesus. And he was just a passenger, but um, I was asking the driver, shouldn't we be turning around because we were heading towards fire and a big flood that was coming and everybody else was going the opposite direction. And from the back seat, Jesus said, keep going straight. He said it three times, keep going straight. Keep heading for the fire and the water. And I realized that he was telling me that the diagnosis was not correct. And I went to the doctor the next day and I said, doc, suppose I did qualify for treatment, what would you do first? And he said, well, we'd have a bone scan. So I said, well, I have good insurance. Why don't we just have one? So he scheduled a bone scan and uh, I went to have the bone scan done with my wife. And after the scan, the technician came in and said, well, we're having a problem with our machine that must be broken. He did that twice. Each time he got a new machine, he finally came back and said, we can't find any cancer in your bone. <laughs> so I qualified for treatment and here I am. So my miracle was I was able to be treated and that dream led the way. That's a great story. The, <laughs> the nearness of the father. That's just beautiful. I, I, any other any other questions, you all? Uh, this is so rich. It's so critical. I, any other questions? Any questions you want to put in the chat? Judith, any any closing words for next week, next time, anything you need to say? I think we're just opening. I don't think we should close yet. <laughs> this is good stuff. It's good. That's... But I, I think I have a request. I don't know if it is a, a closing remark. I have a request. Would the doctor, I mean, you're all doctors. Now I don't know which one. Would all the doctors on the call be willing to help us lead the group if we put together a group maybe five, six, I don't know how many people will, uh, will, will want to, to work through their trauma and uh, self-care. Would you be willing to, to join us and help us work through all these things? For example, you asked uh, who wants to share and I don't know even know, I don't know what to share because I don't know how I feel or what I feel or what I should feel. I know of instances that I have questions about, but I don't have feelings to define what, what I, they exactly mean to me. Yeah. So I, for example, if you lose a mother and you are a child and you grow up without parents, like 
I don't know if I am mad. I don't know if I am hurt. I know God has uh, been faithful. But uh, those are the areas I never want to even revisit because I don't know what they would do to me. Or if you are mad and you have a miscarriage, one, two, what do you do? Like, how do you deal with that? So I think for me, I am in an escape mode. <laughs> if that's, I try to run away from what I know I have to deal with. So please, I think my plea is that I follow up on this conversation. We set up a group with whoever is on the call and is willing. I, I like the, what the doctor suggested that we have a, a community agreement, like uh, commit to being, um, to, to, to being a safe group. And I think we can ensure that be our brothers keepers, but help us deal with all things. I know some people have shared about I mean, divorces and miscarriages and uh, domestic violence and disappointments. So we really want to deal with it. I don't want to grow up running away. So that's my, that's my plea. I'm in. I'm, I'd be honored to help. And I, I wanted to respond uh, to, 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 uh, to Thomas. Uh, and just to say, Thomas, I think you're on to something. I think culture does have something to do with that. I still think the group would help because you could begin, you could, even if you don't speak, you can begin to understand uh, these 10 phases and may, and may be able simply to acknowledge uh, having felt it without having to talk about it. I think it's a good way to maybe approach it. And then eventually maybe lead into talking about it mm -hmm. because beyond the cultural borders, we're all human. We all have the same feelings. Um, we go through the same stages of grief. And like my dad has said, you know, being able to really talk about it and opening yourself up and being vulnerable is a huge step in your healing process. We got it. We got a great from Thomas. You know, sometimes I wonder, and I'm, I'm curious, uh, Dr. Thompson, I, I like that title, the, the, the two-headed Dr. Thompson. Um, do, do you think that, do you think culturally speaking that, that maybe there are, uh, I'll just speak from my example or my experience, anger was more tolerable in my family than was tears or sadness like it's okay if you go run through a wall and punch a hole in the car but it's not okay to cry right and so yeah. it's this there's one type that is acceptable another that's not so I, I wonder culturally if if that's could possibly be a play to that I have no idea well I think that it's universal and uh for I I have had a running conversation with my wife, Sherry, and uh, just, just recently, I was able to kind of express myself a little bit better than I usually do. But I think for all men, the go-to emotion is anger. And I simply had to admit to her um, earlier this year that I just didn't know any other way to express emotion except anger and I don't know how to go back into my childhood and and get something else but but I begged her to just uh, uh, take me at my word and my and my offer would be that whatever you think I should feel when I get angry imagine I'm feeling that <laughs> because that's probably how I really am feeling and I just don't know how to do it do it otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Great point. Really good point. But I think you have a good point too, in that for um for some of us, you know, that when we can't really talk about our feelings, and dad's taken it a step further by saying, acknowledging that he doesn't know how to feel anything other than anger. And sometimes it's hard to 
express yourself. But I think that the anger, um, if we, you know, as ministers and pastors, recognizing that that anger is maybe a sign that there are underlying feelings and that there's more going on to the situa- in the situation than what we see. Um, and then just being willing to, you know, forgive, not necessarily, um, you know, to accept that it's okay, but to know that that is part of the, the grief process. Is, wouldn't you say that's correct? Yeah, yes, that's, that's right. We all do. F- but I, I honestly, when I feel angry, I think I'm being emotional. And I'm not aware that it's coming out like anger, but I have to acknowledge that that's how she's receiving it. So I have to go inside myself and realize, well, I just have to admit, I don't know how how to do emotion then because I I thought I was showing that. (laughs) My plea, my, my plea, was it accepted or rejected? It's been accepted, I think. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> What's that? She said, was her plea accepted or rejected? To help? Oh, yes, I, I put it on the chat. Yes, I'm in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and who else is in? I, I think, uh, yeah, we had a couple jump in. Joan, Joan mentioned something here. I'm in a noisy place, so I cannot speak, but I'm currently, it feels like a mixture of going through burnout, physical distress, and anger after losing my job and learning mm-hmm. to live by faith as a full-time minister. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Coming, from, coming from having excess income to believing God for a breakthrough is one of the hardest experiences, but I guess the group will help. Mm-hmm. All right, Judith, are, are we ready to, uh, any other questions from the audience? <laughs> Dr. Becky, any final closing words you want to or need to leave us with? Dr. Randy, I'm going to ask you the same thing. Yeah, the only thing that I want to say is as I'm reading each person's name on the screen, Um, from Thomas to Gladys to Tim to Lillian to Jay to Dora to Jose to Andrew to Sarah to Zian to Joyce to Grace, you know, um, is to know that our hearts are with you. And, you know, we don't know. um, I can only imagine some of the things that you experience. And uh, we just want to extend our heart our hearts to you and for you to know that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not alone. Um, You have us, you have uh, Dr. Epperson and Dr. Risa and Dr. Tim, and we're a family and um, we're, you know, we just want you to feel love and to feel the love of Christ through us, but also to know that um, you're in our hearts and we do consider you dear friends and, and sisters and brothers. Well, so let me follow up on that and just I have a very brief word, uh, but I would uh, like to offer extend grace and peace to each one of you, and I would like you to offer yourselves grace and peace. And I mean, what I mean by that is each individually be kind to yourself, give yourself room for grace. I liked what you said, Doctor, about the uh, Pastor Kato's question. Uh, pastors taking on uh, a lot from the from the congregation because we, I know we pray and believe God for healing, but at the same time we are not the healers. But it affects us as uh, ministers. If you pray for someone and then they don't make it, is that disappointment that God has disappointed you, has not approved you as a, as a minister? 
I wish you can say just one sentence before we go to, to comfort the ministers here. Comfort the men. Do you have a word for the ministers that uh, lay hands on those and are not healed and die? Yes, I think that um, God promises only to be here with us, carrying us through all of these. And I would pray that for each one of you gentlemen, that you would sense God's presence as you're trying to lead people through their grief and, uh, and that you would be able to lean on him and uh, listen for his word, even if you don't feel his presence. And that ultimately that you would have a deep confidence that you don't need to have the answers. You mm. just need to be there because that is all God has promised to do as well. Yeah. Amen. Well, well said, Randy. Very well said. Well, you know, I'm going to take this opportunity. I see Dennis lean back in his couch or his chair. Are you in bed, Dennis? Daddy, I, oh, yeah. Daddy, I have to accept the fact that I'm in bed. Yes, I am, Tom. Well, can you give us a prayer from that bed and, and close us out? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Dad, for the opportunity to round up this session with our, our, our mentioning of the prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you. We thank you for this opportunity to appear in your presence again. Like I usually thank you, even today, I thank you. This is not just uh, a class, but it's a healing, like some uh, one of the participants who commented and said, this itself is just a healing. I bless you that among the the people you're healing whose hearts have been bruised, torn, and have been bleeding. Father, mm. I bless you and I give you praise because you shower you in case you, you envelope, you blanket us with your healing. I pray that may you continue to heal us mm -hmm. in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Father, we have been here. We pray that even next week, you get us on, uh, on board in time. We pray and thank you for the facilitators, mm -hmm. Dr. Sampson, Daddy, Dr. Epson, Pastor Judith, and the rest of the participants. We pray that may you continue bringing us together, binding, weaving our hearts together, that as we continue learning of your name, we may also be healed physically, even emotionally. Because mm -hmm. right now I discover that among us, there are people who are really torn. Even mm -hmm. when they speak, even when they comment, you see their hearts are bleeding. I pray that may you fully mm -hmm. heal us. Father, bless you, and I give you praise for this time. As we disperse, everyone goes on their own, I pray that may you find us, gather us again next week. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray and believe. Yes. Hi. Thank you for joining us for this wonderful episode of this podcast. My name is Timothy. You can call me Timo. We are so excited that you joined us today, and it's up. It's our prayer and our humble request that you join us for other more episodes that are coming. We hope that you've been blessed. Please invite your friends next time. Now, in this podcast, our focus is on helping a leader heal from life and leadership audience. We know that it can be so much headache. There can be moments that are hard, that can be painful. But you say we are here to stand with you and say, yes, that it is still possible. To the leaders of going through difficult situations, we say, yes. To leaders whose vision, confidence, and potential have been shaken. We are here to say yes. Yes, you have what it takes. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you are the right person. Go ahead. If you have a specific request, a prayer request, go ahead and text us. Contact at empoweringnations.org or send us a message. You can also leave us a comment. We'll be so glad to connect with you and work with you this leadership journey. We believe that we can make it Jesus' way. You can become a partner with what Empowering Nations is doing in Africa and all over the world. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you.